Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and I'm really excited about our guest this evening, Adriana Barton. First, I'd like to acknowledge that although we have people joining from everywhere in the world for these online events, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Okay, our guest today is a local to Vancouver where Banyan Books is located. That's really neat. Adriana Barton, is a journalist, author, and former staff reporter at Canada's national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. Her writing on health, science, visual arts, architecture, music, and pop culture has appeared in publications including Utney, Azure, and the San Francisco Bay Guardian. Her personal essay, Growing Up Hippie, was published in the anthology American Voices, Culture and Community alongside writings by Margaret Atwood and Garrison Kyler. Book research and journalism assignments have taken her to Syria, Jordan, India, Zimbabwe, and Brazil. And of course, like I said, she lives in Vancouver, Canada with her husband and son. And today, Adriana Barton is with Banyan Books in conversation about her book, which is called Wired for Music, A Search for Health and Joy Through the Science of sound. Music isn't just background noise or a series of torturous, torturous exercises we remember from piano lessons. In the right doses, it can double as a mild antidepressant, painkiller, sleeping pill, memory aid, and enhance athletic performance while supporting healthy aging. Though music has been used as a healing strategy since ancient times, Neuroscientists have only recently discovered how melody and rhythm stimulate core memory, motor, and emotion centers in the brain. But here's the catch. We can tune into music every day and still miss out on some of its potent effects. Our guest this evening learned the hard way. Starting at age five, she studied the cello for nearly two decades, a pursuit that left her with physical injuries and emotional scars. In Wired for Music, she sets out to discover what music really, what music is really for. Combing through medical studies, discoveries by pioneering neuroscientists, and research from biology and anthropology. This is a fascinating book, and her investigation gets to the heart of music's profound effects on the human body and brain, blending science and story. Wired for Music shows how our species' age-old connection to melody and rhythm is wired inside us. If you'd like to learn more about today's guest, please visit her website, which is www.adrianabarton.com. Banyan community, please join me in a warm welcome for Adriana Barton. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. I love your candles flickering in the back background it just looks like a cozy spot you're sitting in oh thank you it is cozy yeah that's our little banyan uh 
ritual before each one. I light the candles. So nice. Yeah. Uh, Adriana, you're joining us from Vancouver, I assume. That's right. I'm in my home, ready to Wonderful. chat with everyone from around the world. <laughs> Very nice. It's so great to have you here. And this is an awesome book. Uh, maybe we can just dive right in. Um, in chapter one, you tell the story of your challenging relationship with the cello from childhood into early adulthood, uh, telling the story of playing at a memorial for 14 women who had been killed by a misogynist gunman, you write, strains of Bach, tender yet steely, had absorbed, had absorbed the terrorizing thoughts. For those brief moments, music had invited the gathering to feel and find solace, a kind of healing, but not for me. I'm wondering if you can give our audience some context around your relationship with playing music in your early life. Well, um, there were many aspects to it, obviously. I mean, there were moments of joy and moments of, of great satisfaction, uh, definitely moments of accomplishment that was emphasized a lot. Uh, I was enrolled in a very formal and very strict uh, conservatory at the age of five. And what that meant, it wasn't your Sunday afternoon lessons on, on Saturday or, or sorry, your lessons on Sunday or on Saturday at someone's home. It was a formal conservatory with theory and orchestra and solfege, which is sight singing and, um, and rigorous training from a young age. And a lot of the people in my classes were in, in uh, high school. So it was attached to a sejep in Quebec. Uh, which is sort of an odd environment for a five-year-old, six-year-old, et cetera. And um, there, were, there, was, there were reasons for that that I didn't understand later. But essentially, the first time I, I held a cello, I was entering into a kind of Faustian bargain where ex in exchange for free lessons, we, we didn't have a lot of money, um, I was expected to uh, dedicate myself to becoming a professional musician. And that was the deal, but I wasn't really sure about it at the time uh, because I was too young to understand it all. And uh, I, I was a dutiful child and I, I took up that, that goal and uh, dedicated myself for 17 years. And along the way, just began to question what it was all for and started to chafe at the, the formal aspects of it and the entrenched tradition and, and the, the, I started to have injuries in my arms and wrists as well. One of the things that I, I find really fascinating you touch on is that it's possible to, to dedicate your life to music like you did with your, your training with cello, but still miss out on the, the full fullness of the gifts that music provides. Can you help our audience understand that point a little bit? Well, maybe I'll get into some of the science just briefly. Uh, what I learned through my research as a, a, a journalist, um, and this work in the book really was a scientific research study for me, a cultural study, an anthropological study, uh, history. There's a, there, there, it's not really just about my story. In fact, for me, that my story isn't the most important part at all in the book. But one thing I learned is that a lot of the gifts uh, of music are social. Um, music really does connect us in ways that many other things do not. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. And there are deep roots in our evolution um, for music, uh, uh, musical activities, as well as musical abilities. So that was one thing. But the other thing is that a lot of the benefits of music uh, stem from how music activates our pleasure and reward circuitry in the brain. So music actually does um, stimulate the release of dopamine and other uh, brain chemicals that are really important to pleasure, but also to pain relief and other things. So um, what happened, though, I realized was that in a very strict environment where every note is constantly questioned, interrogated, and you stop every note. I wasn't playing with abandon in these lessons. I was, every note was critiqued, um, you know, play it again, play it again, play it again. When that's happening, you're activating in the brain what's called the periventricular system. I mean, I even came across a McGill website that referred to it as the punishment system. And that's the system that 
primes us for fight, flight, or freeze uh, in response to a threat. And if you're activated that way, it short circuits the pleasure reward pathways in the brain for a reason. You can't be chilling out and enjoying something and run away from a lion at the same time. <laughs> and so what I realized is that approach to music training was almost guaranteed to short circuit some of the greatest rewards of music. That's really fascinating. I, I, I'm wondering, one of the things that is interesting to me is this culture around particularly classical Western European music of it being so intense and regimented. And I know I've heard you explain a bit about the sort of history of that uh, and what what has sort of led to that culture around uh, this form of music. Can can you highlight that point a little bit for us? Would you like to know more about the history of training or music in Western European cultures in, in particular? Yeah, I, I mean, what music in Western European cultures and how that led to such an intense sort of regimented form of training? Well, in very broad strokes, <laughs> we know <laughs> that in, in pagan Rome, uh, music was part of every activity. It was part of political rallies. It was part of celebrations. They had many, many festivals all the time, uh, parades, uh, gladiator fights, a lot of music making in everyday life. It was the pulse of, of pagan Rome. And, uh, you know, I think pagan Rome in that respect would have been a lot like uh, some of the villages in around the world today where people are singing while they're preparing food or they're they're dancing for while grieving or all kinds of things. It, it's embedded in, in the fabric of daily life. What happened in Western European societies was that um, the Christian church, and this is documented in my book, I quote the church fathers, I'm not making stuff up myself. The church fathers really warned against playing music musical instruments of all kinds except for the harp. They felt that uh, they could inflame the passions in a, in a way that was contrary to the teachings of the church and that bugles and they, they literally say bugles and pipes are more suited for beasts and that the faithful should abandon all musical instruments and they were also making statements about rhythm being very negative too. Uh, so it music became at least church music became stripped down and many people find Gregorian chant extremely beautiful, but it has no harmony, um, almost no rhythm. People just move together stepwise using the, the, the notes you find on a piano. It's, it's very austere music in, in, in that sense. And um, gradually harmony came back, but the church was very rigorous in how it allowed, like it had rules for, that's what counterpoint is. It's, it, it's rules for how har harmonies are allowed to to be arranged. And if you study it, you'll see that it's like playing a game of chess. Like there, you can only, and the rules kept changing depending on the century. So the church really controlled how music was, was composed and listened to, to a large degree for many centuries. And of course people were, you know, playing at wedding parties and that kind of thing still. So it's not like they abolished music, but the church's influence in Western Pian societies we know was, was very dramatic. Um, so that happened. And then another thing that happened was that in um, Renaissance Italy, so the word conservatory actually comes from Renaissance Italy. It, it describes the conservati, the orphans who were saved. They were conserved from destitution. And, and they got the idea in the early 1500s to save orphans from poverty by giving them music training, but in exchange, the orphans had to glorify the state with music as professional musicians. And that became the model for the Paris Conservatory. The great Paris Conservatory was founded um, just uh, around the time of the French Revolution. So here was an opportunity to educate people to play music that would glorify the state. And that model was replicated throughout Europe and eventually to North America. So what we have is like a, a uh, and, and again, the model was free lessons in exchange for this rigorous training. So that's where a lot of formal education comes from, that, that background. 
sorry, that was like it's a, <laughs> there's a lot more to it, but that wasn't so much a broad stroke. <laughs> no, I, that's fascinating. I, everything you touched on there, it's really interesting to learn that, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it. But thank you. Uh, one of the things um, in chapter two, the music instinct, it's called that chapter. You write. It would take years before I understood that musicality involves a lot more than pro skills at an instrument or performing on stage. Although some of us have stronger musical skills than others, the myth of musical talent has been largely debunked. As the neuroscientist Daniel Levitin, author of This Is Your Brain on Music, explains, there's no such thing as a quote-unquote music gene or a center in the brain that Stevie Wonder has that nobody else does. And I love how in the book you, you get into some of the reasons why so many of us in the modern world feel that we have no musical capacity. So I'm wondering if you can share some of those reasons with our audience and help them understand why there might be hope for them if they feel disconnected from their innate musical capacity. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but one idea is that musicality, once you learn how the human brain responds to music and the deep roots in our evolution, you realize how exquisite the musicality of a child is. What's going on cognitively to make sense of, of sounds and, and perceive the regular beat in music and even hear different pitches? It's remarkable that our brains can do this. Uh, so that, I, you know, I got into a lot of depth with that in, in chapter two but it was kind of this light bulb moment. I wish I'd known all along that just to be human is to be innately, exquisitely musical. So that's one thought. And I still, it still gives me chiver, shivers to know that um, a baby, a newborn baby with el electrodes on its head, um, can the researchers have shown that a newborn baby while sleeping, the brain is responding to the beat in music. With, with electrical signals. And that this is not demonstrated in macaque monkeys. This is something that human babies do just by being born. So isn't that lovely? At the same with pitch perception. It's a, it's a, a, a trick of our brain that we hear. Now, again, this is a tech, a little mutant, technical music term, but we hear the lowest frequency in, in a sound as the note. But there are all these other frequencies and overtones above that note that we somehow tune out enough to hear it as a distinct sound, a, sing, a distinct pitch. And hearing that distinct pitch is not something that all animals automatically do. Our brains have learned to zero in on it. Um, sorry, it's a bit of an abstract concept, but it, 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 the, in nature, there's no such thing as middle C. We've learned as humans to hear things like middle C or the, or the D above that. And these distinct notes are, you know, they're just vibrations of frequency around us, but we, we hear them distinctly. And there are reasons for that in their evolution that we develop that skill, but it is a remarkable skill. So pitch, rhythm, just getting that, just hearing it is incredible. Um, the other side uh, you asked about in our culture, what's happened, well, a lot of people feel that they can't sing or they can't dance. They describe themselves as unmusical or tone deaf. And it's really sad because that's largely cultural. Uh, when, they, when they test people for things like tone deafness, which is not the technical term, it's amusia. When they test people for tone deafness or beat deafness, which is inability to, to hear patterns of, of rhythm, they find that something like 2% are afflicted with these, these issues and they are, you know, congenital um, conditions. So it's, you're born with it, but it's like 2%. In contrast, something like 20% of, of no, you know, North American people, uh, excluding Mexico, I'll say Americans and Canadians and, and some yes, Western Europeans, maybe Australians, will describe themselves as unmusical. So what's the gap there is cultural. It, it's people being told from a young age that they have no ear and shouldn't sing. Um, that's another problem. People are told too early that they can't participate in music because excellence is expected so young. And in, in children, this ability to express yourself musically or develop vocal control or that kind of thing, it happens at different rates for different kids, just like learning to read. 
happens at different paces, different, you know, developmental um, windows for different kids. So we need to nurture kids from the beginning and celebrate whatever they bring to the musical table and see what, what happens. And also being excellent isn't the be all and end all. I've, I've traveled in many cases, many countries where people will sing a little bit off key, but it, it's just part of the musical texture. It's no big deal. Yeah, I love that section of the book where you talked about your travels in Brazil and how it sort of opened up music in a whole new way for you because of it was just kind of part of everyday life and people weren't worrying about getting the note perfect and what there's 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 this point about that you touch on a number of times about music being in the body and the sort of cartesian mind body separation we've created in the modern western world can you touch on that a little bit sort of I guess now we're getting into sort of more indigenous ways of knowing around music versus sort of our modern outlook on it. Can you touch on that uh, that way of knowing about music a little bit? Well, I try not to speak for indigenous people, but I can I can give you one illustration that's scientific that's super easy to to uh, to relay, and that is that if you put someone in an MRI machine and they're motionless, they're perfectly still, and they're listening to music, you will see that the motor region of the brain is activating as though they are dancing or moving to music. So how, how what more proof do you need to know of, uh, do you need to have of the embodiment of music? Our, our bodies naturally want to move to music. It's in our, this whole idea of sitting motionless in a concert hall watching something and and not tapping your foot not moving your body not shuffling is is actually quite odd and it's fairly recent even in western european societies it's it's fairly recent people used to mill about in in concert halls when when the orchestra was playing it, it, this strictness and this um yeah it, it it goes against our physical and body instincts to to sit like that so there's almost like a suppression or repression of a natural impulse that we have to have in place to, to do that. Yes. And the church fathers didn't want people moving to music because then they might get excited. <laughs> 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 I mean, if there, I, I wish I could have put even more of that in because they, they, they talk about the gyrations of loins. And I thought, they must have gotten a pretty close look at what was happening at that event to, to, to describe it in such lascivious detail, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so another thing that's really fascinating to me is the role of, of sound and rhythm um, in creating social connection and how that's influenced our evolution as human beings. Can you, can you touch on that point a little bit? Well, uh, one thing I heard on the CBC radio on the news that was very moving to me, um, I'm part Ukrainian, and this was early in the war in Ukraine, uh, I heard a report of people in bomb shelters sitting together and singing because while homes were destroyed and family members were killed, this was a touchstone for people during the, the raids. And this happened a few months ago and it, it made me think of something that we've been doing for a very long time as a species in, in the Schwabian Alps of Germany, archeologists have found flutes that are about 44,000 years old. They date from the last ice age. They're made of mammoth bone and vulture wing and they're, they have five uh, finger holes and uh, archeologists, archeologists believe that these weren't just playthings or, um, you know, uh, ways to amuse um, people that that music acted as a social glue. Um, it was a, a force that bonded people together. It, it drew people together almost like uh, something you couldn't resist. And that encouraged people to live in groups and increasing chances of survival, but also making living in groups more bearable because music would calm people and have them all on the same wavelength. Now that sounds kind of, uh, you know, 
I don't know, esoteric, but in fact, music really does get us on the same wavelength, quite, quite literally. So um, at McMaster University, there's this incredible lab where they can put electrodes on all the audience members and show that when the music is playing on stage, the audience members' brain waves are synchronizing to the main beat of the music and synchronizing with each other. Not entirely because we have many brain waves going at once, but a pattern of brain wave activity emerges so that there's synchrony in the group and synchrony with the music. Um, and when that happens, they found that people feel more pleasure from the music and more of a sense of social connection, which is quite profound, if you ask me. Um, it's this central locus of connection. Music provides there, this idea that um, in a large group of people, you don't have to get to know every individual. You can plug into this music phenomenon um, and feel the togetherness that way. Um, to use a, a metaphor that's maybe a bit cheesy, the movie Avatar, you have the blue creatures and the magical tree and they, they plug their tails into the tree and, and experience a, a happening together. And that's kind of what we do with music. Um, there's more to it too. There are brain chemicals uh, that are stimulated by music and one of them is oxytocin known as a, a, a brain chemical that encourages social connection or uh, affects our social relationships, sometimes not in positive ways, but it, it is definitely released in, when we listen to music, even by ourselves. So when we listen to music by ourselves, in a chemical way, we might feel less alone. It's fascinating. I'd just like to take a moment to re remind our live audience that um, we're going to get to as many of your questions as we can towards the last 15 minutes of our event this evening. Um, so please go ahead and type those into the chat and, and we'll get to as many as we can shortly. Music as a healing form, it's something that's been going on uh, since the beginning of humanity, it seems like from what you discovered in the book. But the, the latest scientific research is showing a lot of different ways that, that it can be used um, to heal things like uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. You, you talk about your mother's um, cognitive decline and, and your stepfather uh, having Alzheimer's. I'm wondering if you can explain to our audience a little bit about how music can help with, with cognitive functioning. Um, I would be careful not to use the word um, I wouldn't use the word heal dementia. Okay. I would say that improve the quality of life of people with dementia. Um, what we do know about music is that it's incredibly resistant to forgetting. So in the brain, we have many different types of memory. There's procedural memory, which is you know step by step. There's motor memory, there's emotional memory, semantic memory, mem many different types of memory. And music seems to tap into many different types of memory at once. And so if some types of memory are, are gone or fading, there's a music recruits enough other types of memory that allows people to continue to enjoy and engage with music, even in fairly advanced uh, dementia. And I think people, a lot of people have seen this, the documentary film Alive Inside, and it's just remarkable to see people light up and awaken who might have seemed unresponsive seconds before. So what they've shown is that music improves um, mood in people with dementia. People with dementia often have agitation, anxiety, depression. Music does seem to improve all of those things. And there's early research showing that it might bump up short-term memory just a little, but that's really early work. Um, so I'd be hesitant to make too, too uh, big a statement, but people have, sh have uh, some studies have shown a slight improvement in the short-term memory in people who have regular exposure to music who are, who are affected by Alzheimer's. Okay, so it's still fairly early stages in those studies from what you're saying. It's early stages for the, the memory boost, but not early stages for anxiety, depression, uh, stress, agitation in people with, with um, Alzheimer's. Okay. 
Which brings me to another point in in chapter four, which is titled Mood Music. You write about a study done with people who are suffering from depression and why they gravitate to sad music. And there was a question of whether that was actually helping them or hindering them. It turns out it's helpful. So I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit to our audience uh, how music can help with emotional processing and healing. Well, there would be two parts to that. And one is that, as I said before, music is stimulating the pleasure and reward center of the brain. And that center, it sounds, oh, just, oh, pleasure, like a thrill. But in fact, it's a super important part of our brain that that um, is involved in motivation and involved in, in um, downstream brain effects like pain relief. Uh, so it, it, it's believed that when we stimulate the pleasure reward center, it can have a descending effect on the analgesic system in the body and that gets complicated but pleasure and reward uh, something that can can stimulate that circuitry is incredibly useful in all kinds of ways so one thing someone is down they listen to music it it stimulates pleasure and that helps people feel better a little less depressed as for down people being down and listening to sad music what seems to be happening there is that there's a feeling of empathy from the music so if you're feeling sad and someone says cheer up does that ever work it, it doesn't you feel um discounted you feel not seen you feel invalidated but if you listen to music that's deeply melancholic or deeply emotional very sad you feel that there's a place for you to sit and explore those feelings and and be like you get from the music what you would from an empathic friend. There's no judgment. The music is meeting you where you're at. And you might even have a cathartic release. You might tear up or, or have a cry or have tension in your body that then releases with the crescendo. And that also is helpful. It, it helps you move on, process the feeling and move on and feel better. And that's what people say in those studies. It makes it, I, I think about this is kind of jumping with that, but in terms of the emotionality around music and rhythm, the feeling around it, um, towards the end of the book, you talk about a drumming class with one of your teachers, Alexandra Jai, and you touch on the concept of trance and ecstasy through rhythm and music. Do you have an explanation for what's going on there when people get into like an ecstatic or trance state through through music and rhythms? I was surprised when I started to research that section. Um, I was surprised by two things. And one, I didn't realize that trance was regarded by many neuroscientists as a, a real brain state, that it's not just something that hippies talk about or you know, esoteric people. It, it is a measurable brain state. And they've even demonstrated that in studies of clinical hypnosis. And by that, I mean the the helpful kind that's used in burn units not the the you know the huckster with the the clock on stage getting people to cluck like a chicken there there's real clinical di uh, hypnosis that's quite helpful in certain settings they even do surgeries um, with that and and that's a off topic but anyway people who study clinical hypnosis have demonstrated that we have um different states that consciousness is a spectrum from unconscious to hyper aware there, there's trance states in between there are trance states in between so if, if you're in the, in the car commuting and suddenly you drive and you pull into the driveway and you're like oh where did those 40 minutes go it's like it was five minutes you've entered into a kind of liminal zone where you're you're, you're somewhere else or, or the same when you're watching a movie there's this suspension of disbelief that allows you to forget that these are actors on a straight stage. That's a, you know, a hazy state that's a little different. Um, so trance isn't quite as as woo woo or or esoteric as it as the word is in our language, as a word describes. That's one thing. The other is that there actually has been some neuroscience work looking at people um, in MRI machines and the effects of of repetitive drumming music on their brains. And they do see that the activity pattern changes in the brain in ways that would be suggestive of a slightly different, maybe an altered state of some kind. And there's a hypothesis that that 
drumming has been doing that for us for many, many, many years. And it might have a, um, a, a purpose in our species in terms of allowing us to feel a sense of oneness and connectedness. A reminder to our live audience to keep those questions for Adriana rolling in and we'll get to as many as we can in a few minutes. I really like in chapter six when you, you write about pump pump tunes. <laughs> I think every, but most people as you write have, have had some experience of using music as a way to sort of get, get themselves motivated or build a sense of empowerment before an important event or a sporting event. Um, how is it that that music can give us an edge and confidence and achieving success. It seems that pump tunes are pretty individual. Uh, some people, you know, like slower ones. Some people like faster ones. Certainly faster ones are going to get your heart rate up and they're going to uh, perk up your brain waves because we saw that the brain waves entrain with the beat. So if the beat is going boom, 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 you're going to have a different brain wave pattern to boom, 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 boom. And, you know, you can see how adrenaline and all of that might increase with a high paced, um, fast paced tune. But what they also showed is that uh, when people are listening to tunes that are generally rated as power tunes, so they, they did a separate experiment to see which tunes people were more likely to rate as high powered tunes and low powered tunes, they did find that um, people were more likely to act uh, in, in a positive way in competitive situations like opting to go first in the debate or in other behaviors that are kind of linked to being successful frankly in in many endeavors so that's again it was a little study actually done at a marketing um, uh, department at a university and um, some evidence that that people also it's just some evidence to confirm what a lot of people have already found that they're, they're giving a speech and it helps them they have their playlist that gets them in the zone and many athletes also use this. One of the, the beautiful things about your story, Adriana, is this journey from, you know, the intense training that you went through and, and the, the challenge and pain that, that you, you endured through that and to seeing your, your new relationship with music emerging. I'm wondering if you can just, for the benefit of our audience, give, Give a little hint as to where you've come to with music and, and what, uh, how you approach it in your life now. Um, and also kind of maybe give a hint to people who don't have any musical background or, or, or maybe they are healing from some pain around music growing up, how they might sort of reinvigorate or newly invigorate a music practice. I was surprised uh, when, I, when I first started hearing from people about the book people you know bought early copies or I talked to them about it I was surprised how many people talked about the musical instruments in their closets or the regrets they felt about never playing an instrument or stopping playing an instrument or the stories of the abusive lessons they'd had or the feelings of being unmusical or the bucket list I want to learn the guitar before I die there there's a lot of musical longing out there that's what I found, just stories of longing and and sadness that kind of paralleled some of the, I'll say, wounding or baggage that I felt around music. And for me, what I needed to do, uh, I needed to go to different musical traditions from the one that I was formed in, trained in, because I had too much baggage with the classical formal training. So I needed to explore other types of music and other approaches to music uh, music lessons, I guess. And what's been helpful for me is to do group group activities, um, safety in numbers, less focus on me and my performance and my mastery. I'm not interested in, in playing music for the purpose of mastery. I, I'm interested in playing music for joy, connection, um, for solace, for um, pleasure. <laughs> so what's really changed is the whole reason to do music. And I, I regret starting music the way I did, where it was all about perfection and performance that had really negative impacts on me. And now I, I do music on my own terms. I, I don't have a practice schedule. I don't 
I sort of play the field with different musical instruments. I, you know, I am not concerned with whether or not I'll be really good at this one. You know, I, I experiment a lot. That's the other thing. I only did the cello, only did classical music, only played the concertos that were assigned to me. Now I, I, um, I'll try joining a choir or I'll pick up an instrument and twiddle it with it for a bit and decide, no, it doesn't really speak to me. I'll, I'll take different lessons. I'll try different teachers. And so that's helped me zero in on the, the, the situations that feel good. And for people you said for who have almost zero musical um, experience and a lot of fear, particularly around singing, what's great to know is that there are things like tone deaf choirs out there and can't sing choirs. And it's not really for tone deaf people, it's for people who think they're tone deaf, where there's this, this um, welcoming to all levels and uh, people of all levels and uh, teachers who are skilled at helping people develop confidence and get over that self-concept of being a non-singer. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I'm just looking here. We have really a lot of great questions coming in from our live audience. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to jump over to some of those. Um, there, there's a question here uh, from Carla. Carla says, what accounts for different taste in music? Someone might enjoy heavy metal, someone else might like classical, etc. There, there's a good question there, and it's very individual, as Carla said. And there's some evidence that our musical tastes are formed in our adolescent years. We're, we're really open to sounds, uh, but we get generally that's their formative period. And, and there's some suggestion that it might have to do with our, our puberty hormones. Um, but our tastes will probably be dictated largely from uh, by our peer group, uh, what we hear on the radio, what we hear in our culture, what we hear at home. Um, there are some people who have a personality trait that the researchers call openness to new experience. And those people might continue to explore lots of genres throughout life. But if you look at the, the, the Nielsen ratings or the, the surveys of what people are listening to online, generally about 80% of people are listening to the same music they've always listened to. And Carla's right that for some people, death metal is the sweet spot. And there's a lot of judgment of death metal listeners because it's really not for everyone. But there's been some psychological research showing that for death metal fans, it's their feel good music. They report feeling soothed by the screaming lyrics and, and the, the harsh, what a lot of us call harsh sounds. And if you think about it, um, I'm not a horror movie fan, but for a lot of people, horror movies are enjoyable and fun and, and give them something that I don't get from those movies. But they don't go off and become axe murderers just because they watched a horror movie, nor do death metal fans go out and do what the lyrics talk about. It reminds me, I used to, in high school, I used to put on my Discman headphones going to sleep and listen to Rage Against the Machine as my going to sleep music. Which there you I go. <laughs> do now, but I think at that time of my life, I was, you know, full of testosterone and, you know, <laughs> angst, and it was, it soothed me in some way. Yeah. There's a question here from Patty uh, who says, Adriana, as a journalist, you were well practiced in a particular style of writing. How did you find adapting to the memoir esque style? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. And uh, to tell the truth, um, I, I was on sabbatical with my family, a gap year, a family gap year that I talk about in the book that was really my husband's idea. And um, at the end of the year, the Globe and Mail where I worked was offering severance packages. And I was really not planning to take one, but my husband said, well, what if you did? And I thought, well, what if I did? <laughs> and I'd been at the job for more than a dozen years and thought maybe this would be a time for a change. And as a result, I had this break from hard news and journalism style writing when I was writing the book. I really uh, spent a lot of time just free writing and a lot of time exploring lots of memories and lots of um, times in my life. Uh, a lot of it didn't end up in the book, but I, I wrote and wrote and wrote. 
And I think that allowed me to shift and pivot to a different way of writing. The other thing was that I, I actually worked with a, a book coach who was sort of a hand holder. I, I, I wanted someone to kind of cheerlead me along the way because there was this massive project and I was used to small deadlines all the time and, and I wanted support along the way to, to meet small deadlines with somebody else. And she suggested that I read the passages out loud to her, even in draft form. And that was really interesting because the book became sort of an oral tradition early on. And what I found was that when I narrated the audio book, which I had to audition for, actually, <laughs> I'd never done one before. And apparently authors have to audition to narrate their own audio books. And, and when I, I got the part, yay. <laughs> but when I when I was narrow narrating it, I was so glad that I said a lot of the drafts out loud, read them out loud, because it was relatively easy to read the sentences out loud because it had evolved as this storytelling style. If you even the science passages, I, I, I really stripped them down and tried to make them conversational. So that's a long answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a neat process for you, for sure. And it, it reads beautifully, just so everybody knows. It's a very engaging book. And the way you weave together your personal story with the, the research is, is wonderfully done. Thank you. Yeah, that was hard. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Uh, there's another question here from Jane who says, Hi, Adriana. I wrote to you about bumping into your book at Banyan after lugging my piano across the country for years in search of someone like you. Can you talk about more about the fight, fight, freeze response? I added in flight, but Jane writes the fight slash freeze response. Well, uh, thank you, Jane, for watching this, uh, this uh, segment. What do we call it? This Facebook Live? <laughs> this uh, presentation, this event, this yes. podcast. Yes, thank yeah. you for coming and, and for picking up my book at Banyan. And I'll just say quickly, if I may, uh, when I moved to Vancouver in 1995, Banyan was the first bookstore I came across. And it was just an oasis of lovely things and inspiring books. And I was 25 and I, I really, it's it's wonderful to be here partly for that reason, that the wonderful memories and that you continue to be such a force in, in this world. Um, so back to the question, fight, flight or freeze, there are all kinds of, of things that happen in the body. Uh, cortisol, the stress hormone uh, rises, our adrenaline increases, which is a chemical. Uh, our heart beats faster, the blood pumps because we're, it's preparing our bodies to to escape a threat. So if we're in situations that are not physically threatening, but psychologically threatening, we might still have that same response, fight, flight, freeze. Um, obviously, fight is, is fight the threat, uh, flee is to run away from it, but freeze is to be a deer in the headlights, which you can imagine happens to young children if they're being chastised in music lessons, they're just going to freeze and probably not play very well. Uh, and some research shows that 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 approach um, definitely is is it hinders learning. You don't learn as well with that. In fact, I was um, emailed by a professor uh, in Boston who got an early copy of my book uh, before it was even published. And um, she wrote to me and she said, that approach to music training should be exercised from our culture altogether. And she really um, appreciated the message of the book for that reason. There's another question here from Sabina, who says, Adriana, I wonder if you could address the impact of music on the musician. For example, pre-performance or during the performance. Thinking of David Helfgott's mental breakdown in Shine. Thank you. Well, I, I've certainly at times performing had almost out of body experiences where um, I was thankful for muscle memory because I didn't feel that I was all there. And I, I think that would be, you know, performance anxiety coming out. Um, where you're just relying on your body remembering how to play something. And that's that's helpful because 
all the practicing is kind of saving your your tush in that moment but it's not an enjoyable experience necessarily because you feel that it's all happening without you and um and it feels not embodied it doesn't feel that you're able to connect with the people and what's happening in the moment because you're just so afraid i don't know if that's what the question was about that's how i interpreted the question i think my interpretation would be that yeah you've touched on what what sabina was getting at there as well okay thank you um there's another question here and again thanks to our live audience for all these great questions it's really wonderful to see um there's a question here from delilah who says any thoughts on why so many musicians with some exceptions of course accomplish much of their best work at a young age i i would maybe challenge that assumption i mean we have i can think of great cellists like pablo casals who was playing well into his 80s i believe and and saying that he his understanding of the box cello suites was deepening all the time um so best work i mean are we talking about paganini speed are we talking about you know playing really fast or are we talking about virtuosos for me that's not the measure of best work it, because my whole concept of music has shifted i mean just like athletes are more nimble uh, a, a classical musician is essentially an auditory motor athlete and certainly when we're younger we're going to be no, more nimble but that deepening of musicality and emotional connection and understanding of um, the meaning or intention behind the music and and understanding how to um, connect and even meld with the other musicians you're with that increases through life and it becomes far more rich an experience i mean i don't play the instruments i play right now nearly as well but i feel that i've grown so much as a musician even in the past 15 years wow that that's a really beautiful answer to that question yeah very moving thank you it's so it's so uh, it's heartening to think about that uh you know, because there's so much weight put on youth in our culture, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So much weight put on youth and not not as much honor given to the elderhood and what comes with that. Well, I'll just add something there. And um, there's just a, a paragraph or two in the, I have a chapter on music for healthy aging called The Beat Goes On. And there's a paragraph or two there with quotes from people who took up cello, uh, violin, difficult to play instruments in their 60s and saying that this was a deeply meaningful endeavor for them. They weren't trying to be the next Yo-Yo Ma. They, they, one said that the day that she had her first cello lesson was more important to her than her birthday. Wow. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question here. Maybe two, let's see. This is from Hoda, who says, as an aging woman, music brings quality to my life. Would you, s oh, hang on. I'm sorry, I'm just reading this question as I go along. We've actually just answered that question. It's about, Hoda says, would you speak more about the expanding views of those, for those of us who are aging? So I think we've touched on that point, my apologies just was reading that one off the cuff. So I'll move on. There's a question here from Charlene who says, why are different people drawn to different instruments? Someone might be driven to rhythm and drums, others to bass or to harp, etc." That's an interesting question. And I can't say that I came across research that would answer it precisely. Uh, my hunch is that people might be drawn to things that remind them of other things. So, I mean, someone who loves the harp, perhaps the harp reminds them of the sound of their mother's voice. Or someone who loves the drums uh, might have grown up in a really rhythmic environment, uh, possibly. I mean, certainly people who long to play classical instruments 
have that longing because they've heard them. If you've never heard one, then you wouldn't want to play a, a viola or a violin because you don't even know what they sound like. So it's not a satisfactory answer, um, mainly because I haven't seen research that that would pinpoint that. But I would say it has to do with what you've heard and what you responded to along the way. And associations, what a sound reminds you of. Maybe it reminds you of bird calls and you love bird calls. I think there's time for one more question. This is a, a great one here from Lucas who says, Hi, Adriana. Can you say something about the role of soul or spirituality in playing music? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, the longest chapter in my book uh, looks at that. And what we see, is, so I, I borrowed from uh, Sarah McLaughlin's album title and called my chapter Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. Because ecstasy is a Greek word that, that in Greek it's ecstasis, which means being outside oneself. And that's this, the feeling of oneness and, and losing the burden of self that spirituality is all about. And it seems that music is a really good tool to get in that state. Um, certainly, there I couldn't find a single culture just about that didn't combine music and spirituality in some way. Even Buddhism, I mean, we hear a lot about silent meditation retreats, but in fact, there's often chanting to, to prepare the mind for contemplation. And in the Tibetan tradition, there are all kinds of, of, um, of ritual instruments, like huge trumpets and, and bells and all kinds of things that are part of enlightenment and spiritual healing. Um, even the Taliban, who are kind of notorious for banning music, often use a drum or some form of chanting in, in prayer. So I think that spiritual leaders around the world and and very old cultures understand music's effects on the brain, understand that it can put us in a slightly altered state and and prime us for teachings or, or experiences that we might not have otherwise without music or that might be harder to get to if that makes sense and it's shown that that language um, activates one part of the auditory system in the brain and music activates other parts and if you combine them if you think about it you're kind of turbocharging the message fascinating stuff uh, we've been speaking to Adriana Barton about her new book, Wired for Music, A Search for Health and Joy Through the Science of Sound. It's a really fantastic book. I highly recommend it. And Adriana, I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you took the time to join us today, a Vancouver local, and, and so nice to have you. Well, thank you for your excellent, insightful questions, and you're obviously so experienced at this this event. And the questions from attendees, too, were really good. Um, I see that there are many more we didn't get to, so people can reach out to me if they like through my web website, adrianabarton.com. And uh, I hope my book inspires people to think about the role of music in their lives. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom. Our producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross Makichi. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>